All right, we told you about this. Uh, New York City Mayor Eric Adams is speaking to reporters after police cleared pro-Palestinian protesters from a building at Columbia University. Right. Uh, I saw similar indicators from the Black Lives Matters march uh, when it was uh, brought to my attention uh, that there were those who came to the city to disrupt our city and she was able to, her team was able to conduct an investigation and what I feared was actually materialized and actualized by those who were on the ground. And I know that there are those who are attempting to say, well, the majority of people may have been students. You don't have to be the majority to influence and co-op an operation. That is what this is about. And so if we want to play the word police, uh, you could do so. I want to play the New York City police, where we're going to protect our city from those who are attempting to do what is happening globally. There is a movement to radicalize young people and I'm not going to wait until it's done and all of a sudden acknowledge the existence of it. This is a global problem that young people are being influenced by those who are professionals at radicalizing our children. And I'm not going to allow that to happen as the mayor of the city of New York. So the men and women of the New York City Police Department, you should be proud of yourself. At the request of Columbia University, uh, after speaking with them uh, throughout the week, at their request and their acknowledgement that outside agitators were on their grounds training and really co-opting this movement, at their request, we went in and conducted an operation to allow Columbia University to remove those who have turned the peaceful protest into a place where anti-Semitism and anti-Israel attitudes were pervasive. Approximately 300 people were arrested at Columbia and City College. We are processing the arrest to distinguish between who were actual students and who were not supposed to be on the ground. And we pointed out yesterday uh, these external actors with a history of escalating situations and trying to create chaos not to peacefully protest, but create chaos. If you were at City College and you saw the bottles, uh, the garbage cans, the other items that were thrown at police officers, those police officers showed a great level of discipline to not allow this to evolve to an out of control situation. As we pointed out yesterday, they are attempting to disrupt our city and we are not going to permit it to happen. And we're proud to say they have been removed from the campus. The NYPD's precision policing ensured that the operation was organized, calm, and that there were no injuries or violent clashes. And to be clear, this is not our analysis of what took place last night. National independent journalists acknowledge what the police department did yesterday and they were on the ground to see it. And I want to be clear that we will continue to, continue to use this level of professionalism. And we saw the intersectionality of all the things we have been working on. Drones allowed us to do a complete analysis of the Hamilton building and of the location. We were able to know how to precisely go in and conduct the operation making sure the encryption of our radios because they were not able to monitor and hear our deployment tactics. It allowed us to have the element of surprise that we went on the ground, um, training with our CRT team, precisionally knowing how to go in and conduct a professional operation. We didn't wake up and executed a plan. This is a plan that has been put in place since January 2022 when we understood our police department had to be prepared for uncertainties like this. And so the request we received in writing could not have been clearer. Well, those who broke into the building did include students. It was led by individuals who are not affiliated with the university. They needed, the school needed the NYPD's assistance to clear Hamilton Hall and the encampments outside. A dual operation on the grounds that took place successfully. C clearing the tents, taking back and reclaiming Hamilton, Hamilton Hall. And we said from the beginning that students have a right to protest. 
and free speech is the cornerstone of our society. But as our major concern, we knew and we saw that there were those who were never concerned about free speech, they were concerned about chaos. It was about external actors hijacking peaceful protests and influence students to escalate. There's nothing peaceful about barricading buildings, destroying property, or dismant dismantling security cameras. We cannot allow what should be a lawful <clears throat> protest to turn into a violent spectacle that saves and serves no purpose, as, as I said. There's no place for acts of hate in our city. We made that clear. That's from anti-Semitism to Islamophobia uh, to anti-Sikhism and other uh, communities as our AAPI community. We have been consistent. There's no place for hate in this city. And I want to continue to commend the professionalism of the police department and to thank Columbia University. It was a tough decision. We understood that. But with the very clear evidence of their observation and the clear evidence from our intelligence division that they understood it was time to move and the action had to end. And we brought it to a peaceful conclusion. And we're going to continue to co coordinate with Columbia as we have been from the start, start and all of our uh, academic institutions to find a peaceful middle of allowing our young people to protest without violence. We support the right of free speech and open debate. We will always protect the right to protest, but we must balance the right with keeping students, the school, and our city safe. And it is a combined effort that we're going to continue to move in the right direction to accomplish this, this, this goal. We know that this is only a comma in the full sentence of public protection in the city. Uh, this is not a celebratory uh, moment. Uh, we should never had, had to have to get here in the first place. We can't create environments while children could be in danger, and we must push back on all attempts to radicalize our young people in the city like we're seeing across the entire globe. Commissioner, thank you for a job well done, and turn it over to you at this time. And good morning, and thank you, Mayor Adams. So yesterday, the NYPD received written notification from both Columbia University and the City College of New York. The situation on their campuses had deteriorated to a point where the safety of their students, faculty, staff, and the public was at risk. So last night, at both schools' requests, the NYPD entered the campuses and removed protesters who refused to leave the area. Approximately 300 arrests were made, where preliminary charges ranged from trespass to criminal mischief to burglary. At this point, we're going to let the criminal justice system play out. But as we said last night, the universities worked for weeks to negotiate with the protesters to resolve the situation and to restore order on their campuses. But once it became clear that public safety was a real concern, especially after the protesters escalated the situation by breaking and entering into a university building, the NYPD was called in to do their job. And I just want to say to the men and women of this department, thank you. Since the terrorist attack of October 7th, the NYPD has responded to more than 2,400 protests and demonstrations across this city. About 1,100 of those were related to the situation in Israel and Palestine. And at every one, we've worked to keep protesters safe and protect their First Amendment rights. At the same time, we work to keep our residents and workforce safe to make sure our neighborhoods have full access to emergency services, and to keep life moving in the largest city in the nation. This isn't easy work, but no one does it better than the men and women of the NYPD. Lastly, I want to thank the officials at both Columbia University and City College for their efforts with the developing situation, their continuous and open communication with everyone involved, all right, we're going to pull away from that uh, press briefing with um, 
NYPD officials as well as the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams. Um, you know, his assertion is that part of the reason, and the Columbia University says this as well, part of the reason the NYPD went onto Columbia's campus and into Hamilton Hall is because not only were there students protesting, but they were outside agitators, uh, as he called it, uh, people who uh, both the university and uh, the city felt were creating a more dangerous environment and, and there was an element of in inauthenticity. Now, I know the mayor was on CBS Mornings with you guys yeah. and you talked to him about that. We did talk to him about that and it's one of the things I want to ask Sam Vinograd about because the mayor made a couple of assertions on our broadcast that uh, he has yet to provide evidence of, including uh, how he differentiates, the police differentiates between those outside agitators that he suggested were in the crowd uh, and the students. Uh, and uh, also how... Uh, you know, this might be a question that the mayor is about to be asked. We're going to dip back into this press briefing and see. Inside and outside, and I have a second question. Thank you. I'll pass that question over to our Chief Patrol, right, John so, Shaw. So right now, as it breaks down, we have 282 arrests. As of right now, we have 282 arrests. 173 of those came from City College. 109 came from Columbia. How it breaks down to your question, we'll have that answer sometime today. We haven't broken it down yet, but we will have that answer. Can you give us any more details about the, the people who were not affiliated with them? Or were they, were they um, what groups they were associated with? Good morning. Um, so there are a number of different individuals who we know from over the years associated with protests, not just in our city, um, but in other cities as well who are um, linked to and who we see doing training around the change in tactics that we described yesterday and that we all witnessed. The black block attire, the breaking windows, breaking doors, the vandalism, property destruction, the barricading, makeshift weapons that we um, recovered in the encampment. And so that change in tactics combined with the presence of known individuals on campus uh, in the lead up to what happened in Hamilton Hall is why we had a real elevated concern around public safety. Let's uh, wait a moment. And you know. Um... So that's a little bit of an answer to your question. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, we, we've seen some people who've actually even given interviews, or we've seen video of some people who are trained, if that's the word to use, in how to, or how to train people to protest. Mm -hmm. But, but again, I'm, we're trying to get some numbers, uh, and I know that one of the police officials said that they're going to have the breakdown yeah. of who were who those are outside students. agitators versus students, yeah. uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing about that. So you know who will know about this topic? Yeah, let's bring and you're in. you're standing by, yeah. right? Uh, we want to bring in CBS News national security contributor Sam uh, Vinograd. She is the former assistant secretary for counterterrorism and threat prevention at the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, you heard what we were talking about, uh, you know, the answer to uh, this idea that um, there were sort of outside agitators was that there were individuals who were already known, uh, I guess, to uh, police to be involved in this sort of stuff. And also there was a clear change in tactics. Um, what do you make of the mayor's remarks? Well, what the mayor said could mean, unfortunately, and Marie, a host of different things. Here is what we do know. There is a cadre of individuals in this country and globally that communicate, organize, and share tactics and techniques about how to create chaos around the world. Um, many of them are motivated by anarchist ideologies, by conspiracy theories, and other matters. Many of them also have criminal backgrounds <clears throat> for arranged offenses, potentially e trespassing or other misdemeanors. Others, and this is what we don't know, have more serious derogatory information associated with them for potentially more serious crimes or potentially terrorism-related ties as well. Now, to be clear, we have no indication at this time that there are individuals that were apprehended uh, that do have terrorism-related ties, but that is what, from an analytic perspective, I will be waiting to see who these outside agitators are, what their criminal history may be, what their um, derogatory information may be, and importantly, Mayor Adams noted that this is a global movement. That is true. Again, these individuals communicate globally about how to create chaos around the world. But what we don't know is what um, these particular individuals were motivated by and what their derogatory information may be. And we have to wait and see what the NYPD says later today. 
and what other lo uh, local uh, jurisdictions in California and elsewhere that are making arrests have to say as well. Yeah, and Sam, uh, I know that you saw our interview with Mayor Adams on CBS Mornings, and one of the things that I asked him about, uh, with the understanding that oftentimes police officials, including the mayor, will give out information to the press uh, that we will then share with either our viewers or our readers, and it turns out to be copaganda. It's the police giving Say copaganda, copaganda <laughs> right? Uh, and so I specifically directly asked Mayor Adams about uh, assertions that one of those arrested at Columbia University was perhaps married to someone who has known terrorist ties. The mayor responded that there were multiple people uh, that sort of fit that bill. Uh, should we take that at face value, or what should we make of that assertion without having provided any evidence to us? Well, we do know that there was a tweet by a convicted terrorist who's convicted for, uh, he entered a plea deal and entered a guilty plea for um, uh, engaging in conspiracy to support a terrorist organization, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, several decades ago. He did tweet a picture of his wife present on the Columbia University campus. Mm. Now, when it comes to other cases, Vlad, what we need to rely on here is intelligence and actual invest investigatory work. If there are individuals with terrorism-related derogatory information that are present on these campuses, we should assume that the NYPD, in coordination with the FBI and the Joint Terrorism Task Forces, will be investigating those leads. And it will be interesting to hear whether any counterterrorism officials do provide any statistics on investigations or other leads. But at this time, we do have a tweet by a convicted terrorist showing his wife present on the Columbia University campus. It is critical, however, that the NYPD, the LAPD, uh, officials in Texas and elsewhere do provide facts to back up their assertions. And at this time, recent reporting uh, has indicated uh, that the FBI has said that they don't have open counterterrorism investigations at this time. So when we hear the phrase outside agitators, we have to wait to see what facts back up uh, any definitional element of that. Yeah, and uh, to be uh, fair, uh, as you know, Sam, the mayor did point us to social media. He said uh, there there are some tweets on social media that you can find that would back up uh, that assertion. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, Sam, is something else he told us, which is I asked him if he'd uh, talked to other mayors of other cities uh, where perhaps their forces, their police forces are facing similar protests at universities. And he said that he had, in fact, spoken to a number of big city mayors, including the mayor of Denver. I wonder, when we, when we talk about outside agitators, can we, are, can we, or we, can we assume that uh, these people are acting on a national level? In other words, are they independent actors, for example, at Columbia University, at City University of New York, uh, or is there some kind of a national group that then directs other people in other cities on other college campuses to uh, to uh, help those students um, uh, conduct these protests. Well, that just from a preparedness perspective, I will say that in my time in the federal government, working with state, local, tribal, territorial, and campus security officials, we were all in regular touch about the need to be prepared for all kinds of scenarios. DHS and our partners uh, worked very closely with campus security officials to make sure that there were information exchanges, scenario planning, and that there were really tested plans in place for when, how, and what triggers would be involved to call in reinforcements. A worst case scenario for a campus is have to is to have to call in outside support. The worst worst case is to have to call in federal support. But at the same time, you really want to make sure you have those operational plans in place. So I would bet that it's not just mayors that are speaking about these matters, but also mayors and governors, governors as a collective, and the federal authorities are also probably take, paying attention. Now, as to whether these protest groups are in touch, again, Vlad, there are so many different groups involved here. We do know that there are specific student groups that have a national presence that are involved in many of these activities around the country, Students for Justice for Palestine and others. When it comes to the outside agitators, we have to wait and see who they are. But at a general level, these outside agitators are um, oftentimes communicating nationally sharing information about where and how to protest, why and how to create chaos. So there are national links between both student groups who very oftentimes do peacefully exercise their First Amendment activities, as well as ties between agitators um, around the country. But Vlad, there are also individuals that just show up at a local level 
and decide that they want to create chaos as their hobby or pastime. So it's really a mix of uh, individuals involved in this case. All right, Sam, great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks. So for more on this, let's bring in Philippe uh, Rodriguez. He is a former NYPD detective sergeant. He's also an adjunct professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. All right, thanks for thanks for joining us. I don't. Know, I hope that you could hear the conversation we were having with Sam. What's your reaction yeah, to what is happening at Columbia University and at dozens of other campuses across the U.S.? Well, once again, we're trying to balance, you know, fairness. We always have to protect everyone's constitutional rights. But at the end of the day, people need to realize Columbia is a private university, which is private property. And the moment that they do call the NYPD as a complainant, we are bound by law to do our job. I think uh, at this point, the moment that they broke into the Hamilton Hall, we saw the vandalism. Uh, we also had reports that maintenance staff were not allowed to leave, which is unlawful imprisonment. So you know what? The NYPD had to take action at this moment. Uh, and so how do you handle or navigate these types of situations? I guess the question becomes, on a college campus with students uh, and understanding that they're perhaps are outside agitators, um, is showing up in force in full riot gear the best way to de-escalate what's already kind of a tense situation? Because the last thing anybody wants is to see anybody get hurt. Yes, and I, you know, and I'm gonna be one of the few people that say, as we see the videos, you know, the protesters, they really weren't out of control, they weren't violent, and, and that should be commended also. We need to point things where they, you know, be fair about analyzing situations. But at the end of the day, once a university calls, we have to respond. And the reason is, if we have enough officers present, we're better able to control the situation. Then they're thinking that they're able to outnumber us. And once the moment that we see things flying and, and bottles and bricks and being thrown around, which we didn't have that much of at this point, you know what? It showed the control and it's a level of response. We have multiple levels of response, which would be called levelization one, mobilization two or three. And at this point, that's how we work together as a team. So it's pre-formatted. It's not only just for Columbia, it's something that's part of our operational procedures. Um, last year, NYPD sort of changed its use of force policies during demonstrations, uh, and it's stemming from the 2020 protests over George Floyd's death. Uh, I mean, are, have you, could you see that being implemented when you watch some of the video? How might that impact the police response? Well, first of all, the use of force never looks good. You know, we see this on TV and, and, and movies, and we think it is, but police officers really don't want to get into these tussles of physical forces. And we did see a huge change. We did not see those batons being displayed, you know, forcefully or being used aggressively. Uh, the officers did show temperance, you know, at the right time that they had to push people back, they did. Because remember, in those situations, we have to maintain control for, this, for the reason of being safe, you know? And Philippe, the last question, I guess. Uh, when, when you go into a situation like this, and it's a question that I've been trying to get an answer to, uh, how do you distinguish between who's an outside agitator and a, and a student who is just uh, uh, peacefully protesting? In other words, perhaps they've taken over the building and perhaps they're there um, and the university wants them out, but they are not, they are a student of Columbia or this particular university. Um, how, do you, how do you distinguish between that? Because you know this and I know this, we've all covered situations like this with the police. Once the police start pushing people out, you could say you're a member of the press. You could say you're a student. You could say you're an employee. Yeah. They don't care. They're figure pushing everybody. Afterwards. They're figuring it out afterwards. Is that the right way to go? Well, like you just mentioned, you know, after the numerous protests with George Floyd and everything else, we're being a lot more selective. We're deploying a lot of technology, you know, using the drones. So ahead of time, we could kind of pinpoint who the agitators are. Mm. As we're seeing, and from the previous arrests, remember, from the encampments, we had 70 of 108 arrests. 70 of those people were not even students of Columbia. Right. You know, right. at the point is, you know, we're going to have to do video evidence. We're going to have to end up putting electronic evidence and, and putting all this together for the prosecution. But the small, you know, groups that are outside agitators, that are professionals of what they're doing, they're actually leading these kids down the wrong road. And, you know, it's going to be up to Columbia and to the Manhattan DA's office to see. And I think Columbia students, you know, it should be a little bit different than an outside agitator yeah. in the prosecution. That's All my right. personal opinion. All right, Philippe. Thank you.